our anchor scripture has been the uh, Second Corinthians five seventeen, which says, "If a man, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things." are become new. I'm just going to be reading this part mainly. Um, in Christ is a description of what you already are, not what you are trying to be, not what you are going to be, not what you need to be, but what you already are. Uh, Apostle Paul, in his letters, uh, which are apart from the four Gospels, Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the other parts or the most part of the New Testament were written by, uh, were delivered to us through the Apostle Paul. And it's one of his favorite terms, phrases is in Christ. He uses the word in Christ, through Christ, in Christ, through Christ, by him, through him, a lot. I want, it's important to understand that this is not a coincidence at all. There is um, intentionality to it. And, and take note particularly the preposition in Christ, the word in. Uh, like an author said, the key to understanding the gospel is in the prepositions. Uh, a preposition is a connecting word. Uh, it connects a noun to a verb connect nouns to verb. Uh, a preposition is one of the most important parts of grammar. It expresses the relationship of words. It shows direction. It shows location. It shows time. It shows purpose. And it shows function. It expresses the relationship of words. So the, the English language particularly was not designed to carry. That's what an author says. It's, it wasn't really designed to carry the weight the kind of weight that the gospel calls upon it to carry. I like how this author puts it, that it doesn't carry the kind of weight that the gospel calls upon it to carry. The English language breaks down under the weight and the prepositions go almost unnoticed. Little words like for, with, in, by are actually the key, according to this author, to understanding the gospel. Consider this example. The jelly bean, when I say the jelly beans are in the jar, the prepositional phrase in the jar expresses the precise relationship between the jelly bean and the jar. So this is far different than on the jar. If you say it's on the jar or beside the jar and all of that, we unconsciously unpack this sentence when we hear in the jar, to build a mental picture with substance and purpose because of the preposition phrase in, in. So some of Apostle Paul's most used phrase is are the words in Christ, through in, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. Glory to God. So since prepositional phrases are so important, we should never hurry to skip over them. Especially prepositions in a foreign language like the Greek language, which is very deep and vast. These prepositions are particularly used to describe important biblical concepts that pertain to the life and to, to life and godliness. We have over the years been saying. Uh, uh, understood, understanding death on the cross, seeing it particularly as what Jesus did, as what Christ did, but not something we did. So we've not been able to apply it to ourselves. We, we see the death and the resurrection of Christ as something he did, not something we did. And it hasn't really helped us to be able to identify with it the way we should. But when we really know how, when we really know that when he died, we died. And when he was raised, we were raised. And what he did was recorded on our behalf as though we did it. This revelation is what generates the kind of 
great sense of inclusion that we need for it to be a reality in our lives. It will totally change how you see yourself. Ephesians 2, 5 to 7 says, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. He raised us up now. He begins to use the word together. He raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ that, the, that in the ages, come, he might, ages to come, he might show us the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. What an awesome scripture. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. Therefore, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, watch this, in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So as some, some other uh, version says, I live by the faith of the Son of God, which is actually more accurate. Because he died for us. We died with him. That's uh, Romans 8, 17. Because he died for us, we died with him. Now we are alive in him. Through him, we know and share an identity, spiritual nature, and status with him. Because Romans 8, 17 particularly says, if, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God, and then we are joint heirs with Christ. So if indeed we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together with him. So you are basically is associating us with Christ in a, in, in a common identity. Glory to God. So you're already seated up there. And even though you're still in a fight, it's important to understand that you're not really fighting for victory. You are fighting from victory. So you're not the underdog in this fight. You are the defending champion through Christ. You are no longer a slave or a prisoner. You are now law enforcement. So you can no longer act like a victim because you are the victor. And, and the truth is, if you really see who you are in Christ and live in the consciousness of it, the devil will never dominate you in any aspect of your life. He will not dominate you in, in, any, in any aspect, in, in your health, in your career, in your professional practice, in, in your family, in your emotions, in, in every side of life, he will never dominate you. Because you are who God says you are. I like that song that we were playing when we started. You are who he says you are. Praise God. My, 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 my. The, the, I, I say this a lot. The, the, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John present the photograph of redemption. What happened to Christ? What happened to Christ? What happened to Christ? But the letters of Paul present to us what happened in Christ. So we can, we can easily say the, the, the four Gospels are the photograph of redemption, but Paul's letters are the x-ray of redemption. What happens with X-ray? You look at what is happening inside. I went for a dental appointment recently, and the, after viewing, taking a look at my teeth and everything, the, the doctor says we have to take an X-ray. And after taking the X-ray, they bring the, the picture, the X-ray right in front of me, and then start explaining what is happening in my gum and inside that the eyes cannot see. And they had to do that to know the 
actual situation. So they, didn't, they wouldn't only go by the complaints that I brought to them. They wouldn't only go by the pain that I'm feeling. Glory to God. They wouldn't only go by my symptoms. They want to see the x-ray. <laughs> you got to learn not to just go by the symptoms of what you feel, what it looks like on the outside, what life is right now, what the, the, your friends are telling you, what your situation is saying. You got to understand what, what is happening on the inside because the inside presents the true picture of your, of your true identity in Christ. My goodness. So you've got to understand that, that this is the x-ray. The Paul's letters are the x-ray of redemption. It tells you who you are on the inside that may not necessarily be what you look like on the outside. My goodness. Thank you, Jesus. Revelation is, 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 is like first-hand information. <laughs> Revelation works like first-hand information. No one can tell you when you have first-hand information because you were there. <laughs> you were there. You are, an eye, you are an eyewitness. So no one can take that away from you. <laughs> Interesting, amazing that the Bible says when Christ died on the cross, we were crucified with him. We were there. So Paul is basically saying we were there in his death. We were there in his resurrection. We were there as we are there as he sits on, has been, has been exalted to the throne of the father. So we have the same identical status, the same identical righteousness, the same identical uh, 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 holiness, the same identical victory. My goodness, this understanding changes everything. My goodness. Doesn't Rom Romans 8, 11 say, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal body through his spirit, my God, that dwells in you. So you have the same identical life. You have the same identical blessing with Jesus Christ. You have the same identical righteousness, the same identical protection the same identical provision. So my goodness, Christ telling his disciples, is, he was is expressing and telling them that you may know that the father has loved you just like he loves me. Interesting. God loves me as much as he loves Jesus. Somebody's going to get that tomorrow. God loves me as much as he loves Jesus. Says who? Jesus. In fact, I like how an author put it. He says, redemption is a group picture. Because when he died, we all died. When he rose up, we all rose up. When he seated, went ahead and seated at the right hand of God, we, are, we already have that spiritual position and that same authority is where we're operating from on the earth. It says all authority has been given to him. Therefore, he commissioned us with the same authority. So it's really a group, group picture. And what do you do in a group picture first? The first thing you look for is yourself. <laughs> Oh, glory to God. Let me say that again. What, what do you do in a group picture? The first thing you look for is yourself. Because the Bible says, I was there. My goodness. And since in the, since the group, group picture, the, 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 the interesting thing is that you are, when you are in a group picture, you, a group picture cannot be undone. If you are going to undo it, you're going to have to go back in time, which is impossible. <laughs> I tell you, God already, Christ already included you in this picture. In a group picture, you can't, it's when you see, by the time you see a group picture, you can't, it's already too late 
to say somebody should not have been there. He was not in the class of 98. He should not have been there. He was not in the class of 96. He shouldn't have been there. He was not in the class of 2005. He shouldn't have been there. He's already there and there is nothing you can do about it. God already included you in his redemption plan. He included your name on the list of the redeemed and there is nothing anyone can do about it. You cannot go back and reverse it. What Christ did is for you. My goodness. Thank you, Jesus. You, you just can't say somebody shouldn't have been there. <laughs> there are some blessings that God bless, has blessed you with that people, some people may think you don't deserve. <laughs> My goodness. But the the this blessing this identity cannot be undone <laughs> thank you jesus the bible says when he died we died with him and he did he does this once and for all for all times for all people which includes you and me so he says count yourselves to to be dead to sin and alive in Christ. Thank you, Jesus. When you, it, the, the, the interesting thing is, when you cut down a tree, basically you're cutting down all the fruit of the tree. So when Jesus died and put an end to sin, he also put an end officially to everything that sin produced. Because you can't cut down a tree and not cut down all the fruit that's on top of the tree. So he didn't only put an end to sin, he put an end to everything that sin produced. And we have to understand sin is not just, he didn't die just for the sins of men. Glory to God. He died for the sin of man, which is what is responsible for the sins of men. The sin of man is the, from the fall in the Garden of Eden. Glory to God. Because it's not, the, it's not sin that makes, makes us have a sin nature. Now, get this. It is the sin nature that makes us sin. I'm going to say that again. It's not sin that makes us have a sin nature. It's the sin nature that makes us sin. We sin because we have the sin nature. And what did Christ do? He died and rose again. He paid the penalty that needed to be paid only once and for all. You don't pay a debt twice. Once it's paid, it is paid. You don't serve a jail term twice for the same offense. Once it is served, it is served. You don't get imprisoned twice for the same offense. Once it is done, it is done. What did Christ do? We were not just pardoned. He paid the full price. He paid the punishment for it. To set us free. My goodness, the understanding of this sets us free, not only from sin, but from everything that sin produced. <laughs> from uh, diseases, it's, it's a product of it. From sickness, from poverty, from lack, from poor self-image, from low self-esteem from depression, from discouragement, my goodness, from everything that God did not intend. It is the understanding of this that brings us into the place of perpetual victory. My goodness. You are not fighting for victory. You are fighting from victory. One of the, one of the um, TV shows that a friend of somebody was watching, um, a friend of mine was watching, the, it was a show that they wanted to, uh, brought a lot, they brought a lot of, um, 
professional athletes, thank you, Jesus, to compete in an event that they're not professional at. So it's a swimming contest. So they brought in NFL footballers, you know, guys with muscles, basketballers, you know, uh, people from the NBA and from all sorts of sports, you know, golfers, wrestlers, weightlifters, but they are, the rule is they are not going, going to be allowed to compete in a game, in a sport that they are expert in. They are to compete in a sport that they are not an expert in. So everybody, you know, the cameras go from one person to the other as they are getting ready, you know, jumping up and, and you know, flexing their muscles. And there was this particular guy from the NFL. Wow. If you see the muscles so well built, you know, like this guy is intimidating, you know, mm -hmm. and all of that. And they get ready, the, the umpire gets them ready and then blows the whistle for them to all jump in. Remember, there is no professional swimmer here. So that's the only, those are the only people that are not welcome in this contest. So everybody dives in and then people are swimming, you know, Hollywood stars and all of that. But there was this particular guy that I'm talking about, the NFL guy, the big, strong guy. He's just struggling. <laughs> He's splashing water everywhere. You know, people are having to step away from the poolside because it's just splashing water. You know, it's, it has the best kit. It looked the most intimidating, but it's just splashing water and everywhere. And it was just, a, it was just an ice, ice off. And this guy was telling me that, look, he, he was telling his friend that they were watching together that I know how to fight this guy. All I need to do is I'll punch him in the face and jump in the swimming pool. Because when I get in that pool, there is nothing that he can do. In fact, the only way to fight him is that I'm just going to jump in the swimming pool. And he can't throw a punch. I'll make, I'll make him drown. And it's so funny. It teaches me something that, look, the best way to fight with the enemy is to drag him to the arena where he is powerless. The best way to fight a spiritual battle with the devil is to fight in the in the arena of faith, not only in the arena of reason. So if you really want to exercise your victory, stop fighting for victory in the arena of reason, just trying to figure out everything. Take him in the arena of faith, of what the word of God has said concerning your situation. You beat him 100% of the time. Glory to God. Your victory is in what God has said, not the, what the circumstances is, are saying. Mm -hmm. Your victory is in the what the word of God has declared, not what the world says, not what the economy says. Your victory is in what God is in the word that God has proclaimed concerning your life, my God, that his thoughts concerning you are thoughts of good and not of evil to give you a hope and an expected end. It's not in the circumstances. It's not in the situation. It's not even how you feel. Identity is not a feeling. I'm not Yemi. There's no, there's no, I'm not Yemi Adelaide because I feel like I am Yemi Adelaide. Whether I feel like it or not, I, that's who I am. It's not a feeling. My goodness. Sometimes our cars, I, I used to have a car that wouldn't start in the morning, you know, but after I tried to make it start and everything, it's, it's for the rest of the day, it's, it's starting and everything and only in the mornings and until they told me that the battery was, you know, out and I needed to change the battery. But that car always had a slow start in the morning every day. If that car was a person and could talk, the car would tell me, oh, I'm, I'm actually normally a slow starter. I don't like getting started early, you know, I'm, I'm this and that. But that's, that's based because of how it's feeling in the mornings. 
But that's not the design. It was a Mitsubishi car. That's not the design that the Mitsubishi, that the company called Mitsubishi designed into that car. So the fact that it feels that way every morning does not mean that is its design. Identity is not a feeling. Whether it felt like starting or not, the design is meant, it was designed to start. And it was because something was wrong. And as soon as I replaced what was wrong, the battery, the car, the car started every morning. Thank you, Jesus. Maybe some of us need the battery replacement, which is a recharge from the word of God. <laughs> Glory to God. I got to stop here. And I'm, my, my, the whole point of this is this. The foundation of everything lies in knowing who we are in Christ. You can only begin to live life as God intended it when you find your true identity, not what in the world tells you, not in what situations tell you, not what culture tells you, not what um, the society says you are expected to be at a certain point of your life, not what family defines for you, not what groups of friends say you, you, you ought to have and not what to have, but true identity is in who you are in Christ. And when you do that, you will find out that most of what you're looking for, you already have it. You already have it. You want this and that so that you can get affirmation from your friends and from these people and this group of people and that group of people that affirmation is already coming from the one that matters most. So why do you still need it? Why do you need to source for it from other places? You already have it. Stop chasing it. Stop looking for it. Mm. I read a book like that. The, 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 the title of the book, the, 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 the front cover of the book preaches everything that's in the book. It shows a dog chasing his own tail and just going around in a circle. Because you already have it. And the, the, the guy was talking about who you are in Christ. And the bottom line is stop chasing after it. You already have it. Thank you, Jesus. 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 I, I do hope that we gain, got something from that. And it's, it's the foundation of everything. It's the foundation of everything. Um,